Welcome back. This week on Astronomy News, The Cosmic Companion, we're going to talk with Matthew Bothwell about his new book, The Invisible Universe, exploring most of the visible universe, which still can't be seen by human eyes. We're also going to look at how machine learning recently discovered hundreds of previously unknown planets. We explore a massive world hotter than some stars and dart lifts off on a mission that could help us save the planet. A machine learning algorithm recently discovered 366 exoplanets, adding to the 4,500 or so known worlds around alien stars. These previously hidden worlds were found in data recorded by the now defunct Kepler Space Telescope. This workhorse planetary discovery watched stars for over a decade, searching for dips in light resulting as planets pass in front of their stars as seen from Earth. An updated algorithm allowed artificial intelligence to spot the exoplanets in this older data. One of these systems contains a pair of Saturn-like gas giant planets huddling close together, racing around in close proximity to their sun. With this discovery, the number of known planets around other stars approaches so, about 5,000 worlds. Now. NASA's DART mission successfully lifted off on humanity's first space-borne test to protect our planet from incoming asteroids. The mission launch on Tuesday the 23rd of November headed toward a binary pair of asteroids which orbit the Sun somewhat close to the Earth. Now if all goes well if, for the mission, if not for the asteroid, the smaller of these dimorphos will be impacted by the DART spacecraft as it's going about its life orbiting its larger companion. Now this is going to alter the orbit dimorphos takes around its larger compatriot. Researchers expect to see this change in course using telescopes here on Earth. And in the coming years, Europe's HERA mission will also conduct follow-up studies. The best means to divert an incoming asteroid or comet were one likely to strike Earth would depend on the nature of the incoming body as well as how much time we have before the impact. Uh, several means of planetary defense are being considered, but kinetic impactors, spacecraft like DART driving into asteroids, would be a primary option were a threatening body discovered sometime in the near future. There are currently five major missions currently exploding, currently exploring the nature of asteroids. Researchers at MIT have recently discovered a massive world, 855 light years from Earth, orbiting so close to its star that even the name Hot Jupiter doesn't apply. This ultra hot Jupiter, <laughs> astronomers are great with names, aren't they? Courses around its parent star at the blazing <laughs> rate of once every 16 hours. Never before has a Jupiter class gas giant planet been found this close to its sun, just 2.4 million kilometers, about one and a half million miles from its parent star. Yes, close. TOI 2109b is the second hottest exoplanet yet discovered five times more massive than Jupiter and 37% larger. Temperatures there reach 3200 degrees Celsius or around 6000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than the surface of some stars. 
TOI 2109 B is also likely spiraling in towards its star, which is 70% larger than our sun and about five times brighter than our parent star. The good news, at least as far as the planet is concerned, is it still has several million years before it falls into a blaze of glory. Leroy Jenkins. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Matthew Bothwell about his new book, The Invisible Universe. We're gonna, he's gonna tell us all about the vast majority of the visible universe that, that, is, that cannot be seen with the human eye. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Matthew Bothwell. He is a public astronomer at the University of Cambridge, and he's recently written a new book, The Invisible Universe, coming out on the 7th of December in the United States. And he's going to talk about most of the universe that we don't see. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hi, thank you for having me on. I was going to say good evening. Uh, it, is, it is not evening for you, but uh, I'm happy to be here either way. Yeah, you know, we never know when people are watching this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, fabulous book. I really love the way it's put together. Thank you. And it's quite enjoyable to read. Uh, so, what is it that inspired you to write The Indivisible Universe? So my research area as an astronomer was all about looking for the hidden parts of the universe. Um, so I, I did my PhD in the evolution of galaxies. And then as a postdoc, my whole uh, research field was looking for very, very hard to find obscure baby galaxies in the early universe. So looking back about uh, 13 billion years of cosmic time to witness the first galaxies kind of coalescing out of the darkness. And I found this, you know, it's a super cool research subject, right? Just looking at these first uh, baby galaxies that are actually hidden from light. You have to use infrared to see them. And the thing I found was that people hadn't heard of this stuff. Um, I used to, uh, you know, I, I, I love going around and giving public talks and communicating astronomy. And whenever I would go and give a public talk about my research, the reaction was always, this is super cool. Why have I never heard about this? Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that there's this whole kind of hidden side to the universe that people, you know, even people that maybe uh, are keen on astronomy and keep it with space news just aren't maybe aware of so much. Um, hu human beings are very visual creatures, right? And we have this kind of innate bias to think that the world that we see around us and when we look at the night sky, like that's pretty much everything. And realizing that's not the case and the stuff we see with our eyes is like the tiniest fraction out of everything that's out there is this mm -hmm. kind of crazy cool perspective shift, which just makes, I think, it, it makes me want to learn more about it, you know? Right, and you know, you, you hit the nail right on the head at the start of your book, and I hope you don't mind the spoiler alert, but it's about three pages <laughs> in. <laughs> so uh, when you talked about how uh, the invisible universe compares to the um, visible universe in, much in, in terms of octaves of music, Right, exactly, yeah. So um, if you think about the wavelengths of light we can see with our eyes, like think about a rainbow, right? So red light is the, the longest wavelengths we can see and blue light are the shortest wavelengths we can see. The difference in wavelengths between red light and blue light is about a factor of two, right? So red light is roughly, you know, twice as long wavelength as blue light. 
And this factor of two in wavelengths, so we can think of that as the window through which we see the world. Music uh, also has a factor of two in wavelength uh, being an important concept, which is an octave, like you said. So uh, middle C on the piano and then C one octave higher differ in wavelength by a factor of two. So you can kind of think of our visual window to the universe as being like one visual octave, right? What we can see one octave's worth of information. Uh, and then, of course, you, then you have the question, well, if we can see one octave, how wide is the whole thing, right? How much information is there coming from space? And, you know, you might think it's maybe an octave or two either side. But uh, the answer, which staggered me when I first kind of worked this out, is that it's about 65 octaves in total of electromagnetic information coming down on Earth. And so I think the example I use in the book is if... Yeah, if uh, so, sixty-five octaves for reference is about nine grand pianos end to end. So, mm -hmm. if you can imagine these nine grand pianos all being played at once, and you could only hear one central octave from one piano, how much music would you be missing? And the, the answer is almost all of it, right? <laughs> you know, you'd be missing almost everything. And the same is true when you only look at the universe with your eyes. You miss pretty much ev all the cool stuff that's out there. Cool. And how has you know, at least, you know, astronomy started? Of course, with looking at the visible universe, seeing the stars, watching the planets move, you know, across what seemed to be a background of stars. Um, but how, how has discovery of the invisible universe changed our understanding of astronomy? Um, I think that, that it's almost a quite a hard question to answer just because the answer is so big, right? I mean, nothing mm -hmm. in the universe makes sense uh, without this understanding of the visible and invisible universes working together. So it's why it's crazy. If you go back maybe a couple of hundred years, we had no idea that any of this existed right. at all, right? This invisible light beyond the spectrum had to be discovered and it took a long time to figure out what was going on. Um, these days, there would be no modern astronomy without uh, understanding that there is this kind of vast invisible universe. And there are so many different processes and things in the universe that are going on that we just don't, we wouldn't understand if it wasn't for this invisible light. Um, everything from uh, black holes. Uh, we took the first photograph of a black hole a few years ago. People might have seen in the news that kind of beautiful fuzzy orange donut that was taken in invisible infrared light. Um, or pulsars, kind of dead stars uh, that are kind of spinning radio beacons. We listen to those in radio waves, which is a kind of invisible light. Um, I think if we if we didn't have this invisible light view of the universe, uh, our view of the cosmos would be just so dramatically impo impoverished. Mm. And so, you know, you said there's a myriad of different um, of discoveries that have been made since, you know, radio astronomy and was, you know, first discovered. Um, but it, what would you say is maybe your, your favorite or one of your favorite discoveries about the invisible universe that have been made that most people might not have heard of? So I think one of my really favorite things, and I guess this, this is quite near and dear to my heart because it's what mm -hmm. I used to research. That's what we're going for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, near and dear is good, right? Um, it's um, understanding the birth of stars. Um, you know, I think there's, there's an inherent poetry to thinking about stars being born themselves, right? But stellar birth is actually a pretty normal cosmic process. I mean, galaxies make stars all the time. In some way, you can think of galaxies as kind of big cosmic ecosystems uh, for creating stars. But unless we look in these kind of long wavelength uh, infrared light, which is invisible to our eyes, we can't understand the birth of stars at all. Like stars being born is a very cosmically secretive affair. Um, stars are born in stellar nurseries, like any amateur stargazers uh, out there will probably yeah, will know like the Orion Nebula, for example, it's a famous kind of stellar nursery where stars are being born. But if you look with the lights, you can see with your, your eyes, you can't really see anything. You just see a kind of a cool fuzzy orange glowing cloud. Um, if you want to, uh, you know, do kind of serious scientific research and understand the birth of stars, you have to look in infrared wavelengths. You have to be able to pierce those obscuring veils of gas and dust that cocoon young stars uh, to be able to see what's really going on. So um, just, yeah, un understanding that stars are born and the life cycle of stars, we wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for the invisible universe. Mm, that's great. And conversely, um, Instead, what 
would you say is one of the greatest mysteries, the greatest unexpected, you know, discovery that's just made about the universe that just is leaving you baffled? Um, <laughs> I love this question because I think the answer is most of it. <laughs> like, that, that, that's the kind I love of the, that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the joy of being a scientist, right? I mean, right. the nice, you know, science is kind of beautifully reveals mysteries, but then every, you know, every time we 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 answer a question, we get two more questions popping up, and does the universe just get stranger and stranger? Um, I think yeah. curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> well, ex exactly, yeah. And so I, th I think, you know, what uh, listeners will, I'm sure, have come across things like dark matter and dark energy, um, which uh, are very much part of the invisible universe, right? I think I talk a bit in the book about how there are lots of things in the universe that are quote unquote invisible because we can't see them with our eyes. But if we look with other wavelengths of light, then they would be perfectly visible, right? So black holes emit high energy x-rays, for example, and dead stars can emit radio waves. And we can't see these with our eyes. But if we could see the sky with x-ray eyes or radio, eye radio eyes, these would be kind of blazing out very clearly. So these are our one kind of invisibility. But there's also things that are a completely different level of invisible where they don't emit any kind of light at any wavelength at all. Like they are truly invisible. And these are mysteries that we've only just started to grapple with. Um, so, you know, dark matter, this kind of mysterious substance which holds the universe together. We've known about its existence for, um, you know, a few decades, kind of for about half a century or so. We don't really understand it at all. We have no idea what it is. And then dark energy, which is this mysterious force which seems to be pushing the universe apart that we can't see, we have even less idea about. Um, you know, in, term, in terms of the mysteries of the universe, the fact that dark energy and dark matter together make up about 95% of the universe and we can't see them, we have no idea what's going on, I think is the most kind of deliciously tantalizing mystery. That, that's incredible. And you know, the, the universe itself is, you know, such a puzzle and such an, en an enigma and that's a huge part of what makes it so amazing I yeah you're you're that. exactly you're, you're absolutely right i mean i think that's i i always think of science itself you know as this kind of human journey that we're all embarking on to understand the world around us and it's just it's just it's mysteries within mysteries within mysteries you know and like every time we figure something out um there are kind of more mysteries layered underneath and we are we you know we, we we're nowhere near finished on uncovering these mysteries and it's just it's just a beautiful thing i think that as a species we are engaged in this kind of joint endeavor to figure out the cosmos that we we happen to be living in mm -hmm. and we figure out these mysteries through in part through instruments you know like ascap behind me and um and so what what, what there's so many new instruments coming up in the next few years which, which ones excite you the most and what do you hope to get out of them um so it, it is I, you are absolutely right there are many many instruments coming up that are exciting it's a very exciting time for invisible universe research i think it's I think it kind of really clarifies the power of this kind of invisible light that all of the very, very expensive, exciting astronomical in instruments coming up over the next decade are designed to look for invisible light. Um, the one that I'm looking forward to the most in the very near future is the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's kind of like Hubble 2.0, right? It's going to be the most powerful uh, telescope uh, out there in space, uh, able to see faint things that Hubble could only dream of. And it's entirely looking in infrared light. So James Webb is an infrared successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's uh, very overdue. It's been it's, uh, it's been in, in the waiting in the wings for a very long time and costing quite a lot of money. But we are finally underway. Um, I think as, as I say these words, the Hubble, uh, sorry, the James Webb Space Telescope is taking its sea voyage uh, to the launch pad, and all being well, will launch on December the eighteenth, which is. Um, just so very exciting. I can't wait for it to unfold and uh, kind of get those first glimpses of that infrared sky. Mm -hmm. um, I guess looking a bit further ahead, there's the Square Kilometre Array, which is a radio telescope that's being built in Australia and South Africa. Um, that is basically something out of science fiction. Um, like I started my PhD over a decade ago, kind of doing these long wavelength uh, observations and doing some radio astronomy. The SKA is just, it's like a fever dream of technology. <laughs> of technology. It's unbelievable. It can scan the sky about 10,000 times faster than anything that came before it. 
Um, my, one of my favorite SKA facts is that if there was like an airport radar on a planet like 10 light years away, the SKA would be able to pick it up. Um, it's just going to be absolutely phenomenal. And the things it's going to discover, I think, is just, it's going to just blow open this whole new field of research. Um, I, I can't wait for that to come along. Right, right. And the more instruments we have looking at, you know, additional wavelengths, you know, we can bring them together, you know, looking at the same object and in multi you, you know, forming multi messenger astronomy where we look at the, all these different wavelengths to try to figure out what's going on. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that's part of the power and the beauty of modern astronomy that we're able to take all these kind of disparate pieces of evidence and then combine them together. So I have no doubt that in the future, um, you know, if you take my own field of kind of distant baby galaxies, um, the James Webb Space Telescope will be studying these and then the square kilometer away will be studying these same galaxies. And then we can use the revelations and the insights um, together to paint a, a, you know, a more fuller picture than anyone could do individually. Hmm. Yeah, I think one of the ways, one of the newest ways we have of looking at the universe is through gravitational wave astronomy, which is mm -hmm. kind of the ultimate invisible universe, isn't it? Would you hope to, would you hope to get out of gravitational wave astronomy in the future? Yes, it's, you, I mean, so you call gravitational waves the ultimate invisible universe. I think that's exactly right. Um, if you think about how we observe stuff in astronomy, or indeed like how we observe stuff in the real world, it's we're so used to seeing things. I think we kind of take for granted what an indirect process it is. Um, like if I look at like my cat who's asleep over there on the sofa, for example, like I can see my cat because, um, you know, light from the bulb comes down, hits the cat's fur, and then that photon will excite an electron in the cat's fur, and then that will emit a photon and come to my eyes. And it's this very kind of like kind of chained up process of lots of different things happening together. It's a very indirect way to interact with things. Um, you know, it gets a bit philosophical, but, you know, in some ways I'm not even really seeing my cat, right? I'm kind of seeing the end process of all these physical events. Gravitational waves are such a wonderfully direct way to view um, events happening in the universe. Like in a real way, we are using the universe itself. Um, so the way it works is, is that, so Einstein tells us that the universe is composed of this kind of stretchy four dimensional substance called space time, right? So space and time are this kind of bendy thing. And then what gravity is, is the stretching and bending of space time. So in an Einstein universe, the, re the reason that we're all not floating off the ceiling right now is because we are embedded in this kind of curvy space time around the earth. And once you kind of appreciate that space time is bendy and stretchy, um, it's pretty easy to see how it could make waves, right? Like if you kind of like waves in a rubber sheet or something. And so big, powerful events like black holes crashing together will just set up waves in this stretchy, bendy space time that propagate outwards into the universe. And then we can pick up those waves and we can use our knowledge of gravity and general relativity to understand what was going on. Um, so we detected the first ever gravitational wave uh, a few years ago, and it was the collision between these two black holes. And in a real sense, that was the most direct way we've ever observed something, right? So we observed these two black holes crashing together, and the only go-between between our instrument and the black holes was the universe itself. Um, it's such a wonderfully direct way. And again, that's part of the invisible universe. Looking with our telescope, we would have no idea that was happening. Um, it's one of the most powerful events that has ever occurred. These two black holes crashing together, when they came together, they released more energy than every star in the observable universe put together. And if which would just kind of make my <laughs> my blind yeah, explode, yeah. I know. <laughs> and just yeah, we, we we would have had no idea that existed if it wasn't for our ability to sense these invisible gravitational waves. Fabulous. So, um, where can people get more information about? the invisible universe um so uh, my book is coming out in the u.s on uh, december the 7th as you were kind enough to say uh, at the start uh, it's being published by one world here in the uk and so uh, one world uh, has a link to the book uh, which maybe you can include in the show notes or something and um and uh, yeah there's all kinds of kind of reviews and information and uh, ways to buy on there great thanks so much for being on the show matt it was great talking with you yeah this was awesome thank you so much for having me on this was really fun Thanks. And that was Matthew Boswell, public astronomer at the University of Cambridge. And check out his new book, 
the invisible universe. Next week on Astronomy News, the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to welcome Dr. Sylvia Earle to the show. Named Time Magazine's first ever hero of the planet, she talks about her new book, National Geographic Ocean, a global odyssey. There's a sneak preview of that interview. The coast have jurisdiction out 200 nautical miles. Beyond that, is half the world that is not owned by any one nation that we have to pull together to safeguard the high seas. Half the world, it's the blue heart of the blue heart of the planet where the greatest depths occur. And overall, you know, the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters, about where the Titanic rests two and a half miles down. Maximum depth, seven miles. And only recently, have explorers been able to go first time in 1960 and more recently the pace is picking up so more people now have been to the bottom of the ocean than have been on the moon but the full interview with sylvia earl airs on the 7th of december so make sure to join us then Remember, you can watch or listen to all of our past episodes at thecosmiccompanion.tv. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe. Stay healthy and keep your wonder alive. For more information on space and astronomy news, please join us at thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Happy holidays.